Hi, I'm Andy Perkins with Peterson, Wagoner & Perkins, and this is the Legal Minute. And I thought what we do today is answer seven common legal myths that we run into. You're automatically liable if someone is injured on your property. Uh, this comes up uh, a lot with people uh, when they're deciding uh, what kind of uh, insurance to buy, when they're shopping for insurance, or when they're having disputes with neighbors. Uh, f first of all, be uh, scared of any legal fact that starts with the word automatically because every lawyer answer starts with it depends and there's good reason for that because uh, facts build law, uh, not the other way around. Also, the idea of liability is really something that's decided at the end of a lawsuit and not the beginning. So. Uh, what, when people say, would I be liable, what they often mean is, would I get sued? And those are two different questions. Um, anyone who can pay a, the clerk a filing fee can uh, sue me. The question at the end of the lawsuit is, will I be held liable for that? So as to my property, let's say my house in the area where I live, uh, I, I'm not going to be held responsible for someone's criminal actions. Uh, if uh, someone robs a bank and is being chased by an officer through my backyard and shoots at the officer and injures him, uh, just because that injury occurred on my property, it certainly doesn't automatically make me liable. Even in civil matters, though, uh, an injured person would still have to prove that I am somehow negligent. Usually that would mean uh, showing that I did not take reasonable care uh, in the maintenance of my property or didn't warn the occupants of my property of, uh, about possible dangers or defects. Uh, that often depends on what my relationship is with the person who is injured. Uh, a restaurant owner owes a higher duty to its customers than to trespassers who cut through the property in the middle of the night when the restaurant is closed. So all of those factor into a question of liability. It's not simply uh, where did it occur. That certainly is a factor, but it's really just one factor in determining liability. Number two, forming a business entity will always protect your personal assets. Uh, while forming a business entity, a corporation, an LLC, something like that, is certainly a step in the right direction, it's not the, the end-all, be-all. It's not the end of the analysis. There are at least three things that can affect uh, whether my personal assets can uh, uh, be subject to a, a lawsuit, even if I have a, a business entity. One is, if my own actions suggest I'm disregarding the business entity. Perhaps my accounting practices, uh, the use of the business property where I've blurred the line between it being personal and business, that can pose a pose a risk of dragging my personal assets back into that litigation. Also, the failure to adequately fund the business. If I set up a business entity uh, for purpose of putting my property, uh, deeding my property into that, but I don't have a bank account for the business entity and I've got no cash to do business. Uh, finally, if I don't buy adequate insurance, uh, uh, all of these things uh, can increase the likelihood that my personal assets might still be subject to some litigation. Uh, but it, again, it's what courts call a totality of the circumstances. It's not any one factor. Uh, sometimes you see this uh, alluded to in the news. In fact, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court has said that the freedom of the press and the rights of, let's say, a newspaper are equal to the freedom of speech of the owner of the newspaper or website. And so uh, the freedom of the press is not an expanded higher right than freedom of speech, and it's not a lower right than freedom of speech. It is essentially freedom of speech applied to a different medium. I still see this from time to time. Um, again, the U.S. Supreme Court has said you are uh, detained when you're no longer, when a reasonable person would no longer feel free to leave. Um, so even a traffic stop uh, uh, at the lower end uh, begins to involve uh, one's Fourth Amendment rights and uh, to suggest that under arrest is sometimes magically connected with the uh, with the placement of handcuffs on someone. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, it's a spectrum um, from the time an officer, let's say, initiates a traffic stop. Uh, uh, 
that begins to uh, uh, involve a Fourth Amendment analysis. Uh, and so you can feel more arrested when handcuffs are on you, but it's possible certainly to uh, for a reasonable person to feel detained at a traffic stop. And uh, I, I'm certain if you were at a traffic stop and you, in the middle of the traffic stop, began to pull away, I think the officer would correct your understanding very quickly about whether you were actually being detained. Uh, this is also uh, a myth for much the same reason. Uh, here, your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent doesn't begin when you get arrested. You have a right to remain silent uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so if an officer knocks on your door and asks you a really interesting question out of the blue, like, hey, did you know that Reno, Nevada is actually west of San Diego, California? That might be a fascinating conversation for you to have, but you're free not to talk about that at all. You don't have to be under arrest. That's kind of a loaded question or a loaded uh, myth in that in some circumstances it's their policy that they should, but the reading of the Miranda rights is best thought of this way, as a, a Venn diagram with, with two circles. And one circle is the word custody, and the other circle is the word interrogation. Only when you are both in custody and subject to an interrogation do Miranda rights matter. So if an officer casually knocks on my door, asks me uh, where I was at 10 p.m. last night, he does not have to Mirandize me because I am not in custody. Okay? Uh, likewise, if an officer arrests me, books me in jail, and asks me no questions, he does not have to Mirandize me because I'm not being interrogated. It's only when those two things, custody and interrogation, line up that uh, the Miranda rights are really uh, uh, in play. And the penalty, you might say, that the state has for not Mirandizing me in a situation where it should, where there is a custodial interrogation, the penalty for that is that evidence uncovered as a result can be excluded by a court. It's what we call the exclusionary rule. And so it doesn't mean that if I wasn't Mirandized, I can't be charged with a crime. The state may have independently found all sorts of evidence uh, that uh, it did not find out during that custodial interrogation. And just because I wasn't med read my Miranda rights doesn't mean the state can't use that information. Uh, we see this with some regularity. Uh, the purpose of a notary is really twofold. One, a notary can provide independent proof that someone signed a document. And number two, a notary can administer an oath, and often they are doing so at the same time in notarizing a document. So uh, if I write on an IHOP menu uh, who will get my prize collection of Duran Duran records, getting that document notarized does not ri uh, raise it to the level of having any legal significance. It doesn't make it a last will and testament. It doesn't make it legally binding. Most contracts don't require a notary signature, but it may serve as a protection against uh, one party later denying that they actually signed it. There are, by law, certain documents that do have to be notarized. Uh, deeds have to be notarized before they can be properly recorded. Powers of attorney documents have to be notarized. But unless there's a particular call to a notary, um, uh, a notary's stamp and signature doesn't change the legality of the document. And so don't believe that magically notarizing something uh, makes it uh, uh, bulletproof, makes it uh, a special legal document that would otherwise not be legal. This is Andy Perkins with Peterson, Wagner, and Perkins. Hope you've enjoyed these seven myths in the legal world. Thank you.